right. So thank you for those coming in. We're going to be studying the Word of God today, and we're doing a thing called New Creation Realities. And today, we're going to be talking about the wisdom for eternity. How many here know that God will be the same yesterday, today, and forever? And that means that his wisdom is the same yesterday, today, forever. His healing is the same. His patience, everything that he is. So what you need to do is transition into what the world offers, into what God offers and who God is. For example, the Bible says, let patience have her perfect work. Whose patience? Jesus is. See, if you're reading from an Old Testament viewpoint, you didn't know that God was going to come and live in human beings. And you know, Jesus completely set up a new system. And amen. So God wants us to be victorious. He gave us all the rights, all the things to apply to be victorious. Can you say amen? And so God's wisdom is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're going to read our scripture up here in just a second. Today we're going to see how the Father really desires for us to walk in his wisdom and to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Now, I want to let you know that the enemy doesn't have any more power as far as supernatural power. He's been stripped, but he has the ability to con us out of our authority. So we don't want to let him have that. Can you say amen? And as we follow God, we are to know that God and we do the walking together. We never walk alone. How many ever felt like we were alone? It's a, it's a great deception, but the Bible says, if you have God in your heart, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That means he is with you despite our feelings. So evidently, our feelings are not always to be trusted. Amen. And of course, I'm not going to sing the feeling song. <laughs> a man is over there praying, ah, don't sing the feeling song. All right, so a couple of things. Church, we are to know our... God very well. And the problem with a lot of Christians today is we know about God. We hope we know the things about his return. A lot of people are getting his second coming mixed up with the rapture. And because they have never set their mind to really get to know God, then a lot of the scripture to them is just a modge podge. How many here had, you know, when you got a hold of some of the scripture, you got some picture, but you didn't get the whole picture. Imagine yourself in a hot air balloon. I want to go in one one day. Amen. All you do is go up and you're tied to a cord and go up and everything. But within that thought, just think, you know, when you're down on the ground, you see what you can see in your peripheral vision. But when the air is raised and you're going up, what can you see? You can see a greater picture. You can see where you were, but now you can see out and about. That's what God does with us. As we follow him and love him, he lifts us up and we begin to see through his point of view. We begin to see good in people and we begin to pray for that good to come out of them. Instead of seeing what's going wrong, we are touched by God's grace and start to bring God's power and kingdom into areas where people don't ask. Did you know you might have relatives that don't know how to ask Jesus to come into their lives so that you can ask them for them? I can. Yeah, you could say, God, make yourself real to such and such. And Lord, I bind up the enemy and his deception. Now, Lord God, I release the angels. Everyone's got angels. I release the angels to lead that person to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, where they can make a decision for themselves. I hope you got that. 
Amen. Very important. You can change your surroundings. That's what the enemy doesn't want us to know. He wants us so hung up in fighting battles, trying to get things done, that we can't plan out and speak out God's blessings ahead of time. You know, we talked last week a little bit about going out three months, you know. I think that's, let's go out three weeks. <laughs> anyway, the idea behind it is, is you have so much power at your disposal, but we need to operate in God's wisdom. Say God's wisdom. Now, his wisdom is pure, it's peaceable, it's kind, easy to be approached, easy to be reasoned with. His wisdom will bring peaceable fruit of righteousness. Amen. You'll find that James 3. Okay, it compares worldly wisdom with godly wisdom, and there's no difference because it, we run by our senses, and our senses has its own wisdom. If it feels good, do it. <laughs> Remember that old philosophy. All right, so let's get into this, all right? So as we begin to look at all of this, we're going to cover four areas, and then we're going to look at our scripture up there. Okay, here we go. This is our scripture. Hear my son and receive my sayings. This is Proverbs 4, 10 through 13. Good backdrop, Danny. And the years of your life will be what? So in other words, God wants us to have ears to hear. How many times did Jesus used to say, have ears to hear, have ears to hear? Those of you that have ears, let them what? Hear. I have taught you, or excuse me, I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in the right paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered. And when you run, you will not stumble. It's talking about God in your heart now. We're in the New Testament. So God in your heart will lead you in right paths. God in your heart will teach you the right ways of wisdom. God in your heart will help you and order the steps of the righteous. And you won't be hindered. So you look at a Christian that's constantly going through problems, constantly going through a test, a trial. They're not seeking God and his wisdom. God could just speak a sentence and change your life. Do you believe that? Yes. Well, why doesn't he then? Possibly you've got too much stuff around you you haven't dealt with you and God about yet. Now listen, it's the little foxes in our life that often slow us down and hinder us. You know, when we know to do something, we don't do it. And, you know, God loves us. He's not going to throw us away. But oftentimes, he's looking for the obedient children so he can get things done through us. And if we're never doing what God asks us to do, how can God get anything done through us? Say, oh, me. <laughs> now, you know I'm not talking about you. We want to be masters at hearing from God and doing what he says, and your days will be long. Your health will be full, and you have lots of joy and completion for you to enjoy yourself. Your gardening, the things you like to do. Can you say amen? It's the people that don't get their homework done that usually the flood comes and they're too busy trying to fix what they should have known better in the first time. Say, oh me. So when you walk, your steps will be not hindered. And when you run, you will not stumble. Take firm hold of instruction. Really get with it. That's why I'm a stickler for going to church, sitting up front in the front pews. Do not let go. Keep her, for she is your life. Got one more? Okay, that's it. Keep her, for she is your what? Life. Now, remember, this is Old Testament. So it would be keep him, for he is your Hello? Life. life. Amen. So the reason being everything, remember, everything was hidden in the Old Testament and comes alive in the new. And the reason why it was done that way, so you know, is because God cannot put pearls before swine. And you get somebody that really hates God and getting into the insights of God, well, they're going to use it against the godly people. Look at Balaam, the false prophet. His donkey told him, but better straighten up his act. <laughs> How would you like your donkey to talk to you? <laughs> So what we need to realize is that God has a better plan for you and I, but we got to operate in his wisdom and we have to seek him first. Can you say amen? All right. So let's get into this. We're going to cover four things. I hope you're ready to take notes. Number one, we're going to cover number one, knowing good and evil. Did you know a lot of Christians today 
They, they can't discern good and evil. Now, most of us got a pretty good handle on it, right? You know what's evil. You know what's good. Now, let me ask you, do you know what's acceptable in your life and what's not acceptable? That takes a little harder of growing. You'll find out some things that you used to do a few years ago can't do today because why? You're, you've grown too much. You know too much. To him that knows to do good and does it not, it's sin. So we don't want to be, you know, making mistakes all the time when we know we can operate in God and get the benefits thereof. Can you say amen? Two, we're going to find out who put the poison tree in the garden. I'm going to show you where the scripture literally says that God did not put that tree there. I finally found it. It was right there hidden. Right hidden, but you've got to have the Holy Spirit to pull those things out of there. Now, how many here was taught? Think, look up at me. How many here was taught? Oh, man, it's good to see all of you. How many here was taught that God put that tree in the garden to test Adam and Eve, see what they were going to do? Come on, everybody was taught that. Who do you think put that in the church? Satan. That's right. Because the Bible says, let no man say... Now, is God the same yesterday, today, and forever? Is he the same Old Testament, New Testament? Right? So, Old Testament, we know that it went sour because of Adam's sin, but we're in the New Testament. But the Bible says in the New Testament, let no man say when he is tempted that God is tempting me. So, he didn't put it in the garden. Satan put that tree in the midst of the garden. And I'm going to show you it. We're going to have fun. I hope you're taking notes there through the camera and spread this one around because there's a lot of people that are stumbling all around because they think God is tempting them. God's putting them through the mud and the crowd just to see what they're going to do. And by all of that, he's going to work out something good in your life. I don't know about you, but a confused God is unstable in all his ways. <laughs> God is not unstable. He's perfect, and he's good. Can you say amen? And then thirdly, we're going to find out the three realms of what I call temptation. The three realms. Everybody's tempted in these three realms. The temptations don't go outside of these three realms. But these three realms offer a lot of kinds of temptation. And who's the tempter, folks? The devil, Satan, the devil, yeah. But there are people who will teach today that God is tempting you to teach you something. And you know, if you're not studied, it sounds religious. <laughs> well, God, what are you hoping to get out of me? And now he moved us from faith like a child to reasoning like your own selfish professor that we're never going to be. Hello. And see, an enemy is a master to moving us up into the reasoning realm, moving us out of the faith realm into the reasoning realm, whereby a double-minded man is what? Unstable in all his ways. Don't let him think he shall receive anything from the Lord. Hope this is clear for you because this is going to be good. All right, so in the last point we're going to cover is temptation comes only to those that are in the flesh. Did you know that Jesus was in the spirit, right? But didn't the tempter come to him one time, didn't he? Yes. And you remember, we're going to go through that. You'll remember, it says that after Satan couldn't find anything wrong with Jesus, he says he left, and then he says to come back and find a more opportune time to come back to Jesus, never could. Can you say amen? Now, let me encourage you. The tempter is going to come to you once in a while, and I'll show you why and how. And when he does, just have a poker face and a lot of praise because he won't be able to touch you if you won't listen to his lies. Hello? Jesus said, the prince of this world is coming and he will have nothing in me. I'm not going to give him anything to hang on to me. Say amen. And God is the one that helps us to do that. You can't do that on your own. So be encouraged that God has that all planned out for you. Say amen. So we're going to know the difference between good and evil. Open your Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 5. Danny, did I miss anything? Oh, I hope not. Okay, good. Hebrews chapter 5, 12 through 14. 
Now, this is a small rebuke, and let me give you the history. The Hebrew Christians have panicked. They all jumped ship. They were Jewish, then they got saved and received Jesus Christ. They still hadn't got all of the Jewish teachings out of them yet. And now they were panicking and freaking out, and Paul writes a letter to them, but doesn't sign it. So the book of Galatians and the book of Hebrews were written together. It was sent to the, to the province of Galatia, all of those two books. But to the Hebrews, if Paul's name was on that, on that letter, they would have crunched it up and thrown it away. Most people don't know that, so he didn't sign Hebrews. But if you read it with Galatians, it's the exact same author. Same theme, same everything. And it's beautiful because what he talks about in the book of Hebrews is these Jewish people were bailing. And so this is a rebuke. Listen to it. But it's not a rebuke to you. So listen to this. It says right here, for though, that, for though by the time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again. The first principles of the utterances or oracles of God, that you have come need of milk and not solid food. That's kind of a rebuke, isn't it? In other words, they should be growing, but they're not growing. They're still sucking their thumb. Moving right along, Pastor Kerry, don't stay there. Okay. For everyone who partakes of milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is but a babe. But solid food, everyone say solid food. Give me a little steak on the plate while I wait. But solid food belongs to those of a full age or matured. That is, now here's what maturity is. Those who by reason of practice or use have their senses exercised to discern what? Both good and evil. evil. So you got the Holy Ghost in you, and by us practicing the word daily and loving one another, praying, doing what we know to do as Christians, okay, we're exercising our skills in conditioning with the Lord. Eventually, if you haven't come to this place now, you'll be able to walk close to a place and God says, back off, that there's a wrong spirit there. He's, you touch a book and be able to tell you what's in that book before you read it, if it's going to be good for you or not. God wants to give his kids discernment so we don't step in the pie and have to clean it up. Hello. He keeps our feet from stumbling. He bears us up lest we dash our foot against the stone. What are feet all for? Carrying his places. So God's into making sure he can carry you where you need to go. Can you say amen? And you can get what you need to get. Can you say amen? All right. So God wants us to be able to discern what's of God and what's not of God. What is good and what is evil. Can you say amen? A couple points I'm going to give you. Number one, because we are born again, we should be exercising and being conditioning ourselves before the Lord by practicing the word. It says to pray, pray. It says praise, praise. So we're practicing the word and as we do, we develop. How many here has ever, um, I don't know, maybe you've been a cheerleader or been on the football team where they had to go through your calisthenics and get yourself into shape for what you're about to do? Well, do you think Christianity is any different? And the churches have stopped being training centers and they stopped, they started being entertainment centers. Don't shout me down because I'm, I'm preaching real good. So you, t you go to a church and everything's done for you. It's all entertained. You're, you're burped, you're fed, you're out the door, but you haven't learned a thing. But it felt good, didn't it? Now, I'm not trying to put anything down. We need to be in the Word. We need to understand the Word. God pans everything out by His Word. He matures us up by the Word. So if we're not in the Word, we're going to really be in trouble. You're going to be a walking, reasoning stick of messing up. What do you mean a stick? You have two legs, don't you? <laughs> Amen. So, because we are born again, we have that knowing inside of us of good and evil. You have to say, I have God in me. Two, we are believers. We should be able to discern the difference between the two. Ever since Adam fell, let me explain. This will be a blessing to you. 
his mind became open to Satan's suggestion. You see, once they ate of the fruit, whatever was in that fruit, opened their DNA and their mind to satanic things and natural feeling things. So what was hidden and so overwhelmed by the light of their creation now was all dimmed and out and all they could see was their fear, their pain, their suffering, the evil, and they could still see good. Now they were exposed everywhere they went to good and evil. Hey, check yourself. How about you? Been out to the store lately? <laughs> You're exposed to good and evil. <laughs> it's out there. But our, because we have God inside of us, we have a God filter. And if we let God run our life, he filters out that nasty stuff. Can you say amen? He, he tells us not to, to go to that event. He tells us to go to this event. Tells us to do this and do that. Can you say amen? Why is he doing that? He's getting us to have a full life. To have it more abundantly. But we have to follow him. Amen. Thirdly, we have Jesus Christ on the inside of us, and if we listen carefully to him, he will keep us from evil, lead us in the paths of righteousness, and he'll fill our heart with good things. Can you believe that? Amen. And finally, church, number four, God is good and perfect. All that he does is good and perfect. Anything else needs to be discerned. Hello, how many here have gone out to a meal and they showed up with something that looks like food? <laughs> what did you have to do? You had to discern whether you want to eat that or not. Well, how, we're Christians. We should be able to get up in the morning, meet with God, get tuned up, tuned in, and then walk through our day with discernment, with rejoicing and praise as he fulfills our days in him. Say amen. Oh, it's just not that easy, Pastor Kerry. You don't know what we're going through. Well, let me just hang around for you and listen to what you talk during the day. Let me listen to how you think during the day, and I can find you where all the holes is that you opened up to allow that kind of result. So don't do that. Go to God. Get a checkup from the neck up every morning so that your days are wonderful and full. When, when you we're having doubts, God will speak up and say, don't doubt, I'm with you, child, you know, and, and that relationship. So the, the key is to interchange your relationship in and out the day in all our ways, what? Acknowledge him or have conversation throughout the day with him and he will direct your path. Say amen. All right. First John 1, 5, we know that God is good. Say Amen. And in him is no darkness at all. So look at 1 John 5, 1, 5. This is a message. This is the disciples, John, speaking. This is a message we have heard from him and declare unto you that God is what? Light. And in him is what? No darkness at all. So he's not anything to do with evil. So think about how Satan just laughs at Christians when they say something like this. Well, I don't know what God's doing to me, but I do know I've gone through a real tough time, and I know he's working out something in my life. Now, does God get any glory in that? Now, again, I'm not putting people down with that, but that's what Satan has been selling the church. It is not so. We're going to show you that Satan put that tree in the garden. We're going to show you that Satan altered man's condition, that Satan is the author of sin, and we don't have anything to do with them. Can you say amen? But he likes to mingle and mix and get attention. He's an attention getter. So when you hear, I love you, my child, you'll hear your head he knows God said something to you, but he can't figure out what he said. And he says, ah, oh, you're a jerk. How can you even think God loves you? And then you got this kind of conversation. Come on, smile at me. Come on in your head. Just rebuke it all. Folks, I want to tell you, thank God you're not a pastor. I can tell you one time I was in bed. 
I was sleeping in the morning. I can't tell you whether I was in the body or out of the body. And there stood right by my closet a demonic spirit, a big principality. Okay, and he had instruments and, and jewels all through his body. And I woke up and I can't tell you if I was like, dreaming or sleep but all I do remember doing is I, I rebuke you in Jesus name the thing went poof like that I said Lord what is that doing in my house you know now that was a long time ago and a lot of things were going wrong at that time and that's what it was doing in the house but thank God you don't have to ha worry about that be concerned about that devils should run from you can you say amen Get up in the morning, get so charged up. It's like your flashlight. What happens at night? How, how many has ever used a flashlight on your, on your phone? I mean, when I first discovered that, I thought, this is cool. Long time ago. Turn the flashlight and you're walking to the, well, we walk to the mailbox and get mail sometimes at night. And the, what does the light do? It pushes away the darkness, doesn't it? That's who you are. But Satan doesn't want you to get a picture of that. When you get up in the morning, you're pushing away darkness because you're projecting God. Say amen. But you've got to see it. You've got to see it, see it, see it. Why? So it's a reality. You don't have to talk yourself in it anymore. You see it. Father, I am a child of light. And if you're in me, then there's no darkness in me. I can't talk about my flesh all that much. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so that's who we are. I hope this charges you up. Now, wisdom for eternity. All right, so my second point is, who put the altered tree in the midst of the garden? Go with me to Genesis chapter 2. First of all, everything God is is redeeming, gathering, saving. Why would he put a tree in the garden to poison his kids? You see, if you don't really know God, then you're going to say things like, oh, he's tempting us, he's doing this. But I tell the people that talk like that, you really don't know your God, do you? And they'd start all tearing up or get mad at me and stomp off. Because if you would know your God, you would know that he's not capable of doing all that. But only those who spend time with him will know. You see, hello? What if you had a father and every time you did something wrong, he backhanded you? Well, that was awful. But don't take earthly fathers and, and try to describe God that way. He's perfect, isn't he? So look at this. <coughs> Who poisoned that tree? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. It says, And the Lord planted a garden in the eastward of Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed... And out of the ground, the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant. Would you underline this, please? That is pleasant to the sight and good for food, period. Okay. Every time you see an and or once there's a period, this is a different act. Now watch. All right. Right there. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and a different act. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, and I'm stopping there. What's that doing in the midst of the garden? So let's go down and let's look at verse uh, 15. Then the Lord, I think it's 15, yeah, 15. Then the Lord God said to the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it. And to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it, you will surely what? Die. That's right. So we know that it wasn't a pleasant tree. We know Satan was standing right there talking to Eve, trying to get her to eat it. Now, where was Adam? I've heard one of my favorite teachers this the other day say, Adam was out naming animals. No, Adam was standing right behind his beautiful wife, overwhelmed by her beauty, and acting like an idiot, and the devil's talking to his wife. Wasn't that a pretty good idiot-like conversation? Yeah. I mean, so get the real picture. He wasn't off naming something. 
The devil has been courting his wife for quite some time. We don't know how long. But got to her and finally she broke down and she ate. And then it says she turned and gave to her husband with her. So he wasn't out naming bugs. He wasn't fishing. He was standing right there. And both the eyes were open. And this is why I'm saying, once their eyes were open, Satan can now suggest into our minds. So you're driving along, you're praising the Lord, listening to some Christian music, and suddenly something nasty just shoots through your mind. Well, you know who threw that in there? Doesn't mean you sin. Don't start rebuking. You know, first of all, he's fishing. And, and you know, if you know anything about the internet, they fish and see who's the sucker going to hit the little button. Satan's a fisherman. He's going to fish you. He's going to suggest to you. He's going to get you to try to break down one way or the other. When you meet with God, God takes care of all that because he warns you when the fisherman's around. Say amen, somebody. You guys look like you're all lit up for the word. It's wonderful. So don't give him anything to catch you with. And they say, well, Lord, you're going to have to help me with it. Absolutely. So a couple of points. Number one, we can see God planted every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Did he put the altar tree there as a temptation to test them? What's the answer, class? No. Unequivocally, no. God is not stupid. Doesn't he know what you're going to do before you're going to do it? That would be stupid for him to do that. Yeah, somebody asked the real hard questions. I love these hard questions. Remember, the only reason I know anything, and forget the I part, is for three years I was a Bible answer man on Green River Community College. You talk about have to know the Bible. These kids, college kids, you have to discern who really was seriously asking a question and who is just picking to argue. And I got conditioned really well. So just about any theme you can imagine, I have some kind of answer for you. Might not be the right one. <laughs> anyway, so that's really exercised me good in some of these things that a lot of people just accept as, oh, well, Lord, I know you're going to work it all out. Well, you're going to get a work it all out type of walk. And you don't want to come see, come saw, I walk. You want to know where you're going so that when you show up, you'll be there. <laughs> Amen. And I'm, I'm convinced a lot of people don't like this kind of preaching because it gives you room to be blessed and no room to use loose interpretations of Scripture. This is a word church. Say word church. Wordies, breakfast of champions. Amen. So let's go on. Second, when then did God let them, why did God tell them, excuse me, not to eat of the tree if he put it there? And it's in the Hebrew, don't you eat of it. It was with great emphasis. That's why Eve said, and don't touch it either. She added that. So when God says, don't do something, it's death. Didn't he? he? says, you're going to eat it, you're going to die. Hello. Now, I'm sure the Hebrew was a little more descriptive than that. But actually, if you look it up, and there's no extra thing, but it says, in dying, you will die. So in eating of the tree, in dying, spiritually, eventually you'll physically die 900 and some odd years later. So you die here, and then you will die later. And the look at the mankind. They had lived long ages until the flood. Then 120 years is expectancy. And if that, you go back 40 years, you go back 100 years in the United States, average life is, uh, span of a human being was 46 to 50. Now look, what is it, 72, our new 60? <laughs> you see, it's our exposure to God, America. How much God is in this nation? A lot. Compared to other nations, I've been around. A lot of God's in this nation. There's a lot of other things too. <laughs> but because we are to God. So let me explain one more thing and then we'll get through this. I'm still a little early. When I was traveling as a missionary, we flew from Miami to up out of America, down into Port-au-Prince, Haiti. 
in Haiti, in the Caribbean. Haiti is right next to Dominican Republic. They're on an island together next to Cuba. Okay, but when we left America, there was a dome of blessing over America. It was the most amazing thing. And when we popped out of the dome, it was like there was a void. Now, I'm talking about in a jet airplane with a whole bunch of passengers. And I'm ex talking to my, con my 10 congregationals, and I'm saying, you know, Sat, we just popped through something, and that was the dome of the blessing covering America, because this is a God nation still. And then when we got ready to fly into... Haiti, you could just feel the sludge and the heaviness because they're into voodoo and to all kinds of witchcraft. And you could see there, there wasn't very much light. So you need to know the principalities and powers, these things in the air. Satan is the prince of the air. Where does he dwell? He dwells three places. Air, earth, under the earth. And that's why we can see weird things flying around once in a while, and our government even notices them, but they won't talk about it. And then there's weird things happening on the earth. We can all see that. And there's weird things that are happening underneath the earth because they're hearing sounds. There's equipment. There's people are digging, and they can't find out what's going on. Our government is really upset, and it's really easy. The Bible says the enemy dug into the earth. Well, if you know that devil, if you know God's going to flood the earth, where would you go to hide from the water? Anywhere. <laughs> There's cities in Cappadocia, Turkey. Everyone say Cappadocia. It's a province in Turkey where there are cities dug under the earth that will house up to 20,000 people. Who dug them? Who dug them way before the flood? Well, the Nephilim dug them. The, the fallen ones dug them. It's no big deal. We, we make it such a big deal. No. And we look at all this, and the enemy's trying to take the planet. As long as you and I are here, he can't have it. Can you say amen? Only he will let until he be taken out of the way. And the he isn't the Holy Spirit. I was told in Bible college that God's going to remove the spirit off the earth. Well, if he removes the spirit off the earth, who, who can get saved? You can't get saved without the spirit. So Holy Spirit's not removed during the tribulation. The church is. We're withholding. Our prayers are withholding. For your family, your prayers are covering your family. Do you understand? We're praying for America. We're praying for godliness. We're praying for righteousness to replace corruption. We're praying for the people to repent of abortions. God showed me a vision of all those millions and millions. I think there's over 40 million children up there that have been aborted. They are full grown. And God has named everyone. I, I told God I want to hug every one of them. I don't care if it takes me half of eternity because I love them and I care about them. Now, the key is, is some people have had abortions. Is there forgiveness for them? Absolutely. And that's why I don't preach issues like that because some people have gotten abortion, then they got saved and they're forgiven, see? And there's no sense bringing up what they did wrong all the time. So you have to be sensitive as a pastor. But I'm totally against murder, aren't you? And we all know better now. Say amen. All right, let's get on to this and finish up. Please finish up, Pastor Kerry. All right, so let's go to the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3. We're going to start with verse 1. I want you to see something. I want you to, number one, see the word serpent. Now, I'm not trying to glorify the enemy because I bind him. But that serpent is an unusual serpent because it's the serpent that hypnotizes. I forget what kind they call it, but nephla or something, a serpent, where it's, it's the one you see coming out of the basket, you know, where the guy's playing the flute and it has a trance and all. That's Satan. Okay. Now, folks, don't get weird or anything. He's a, he's a serpent. Now, think about it. Is he a real serpent? Well, yeah. Let's look at China. What is their theme for China? It's a dragon serpent. Japan? A dragon serpent. 
Are we so dumb to realize Satan has done his best to get everybody, every language, everything involved into serpent worship? And a small group went with Adam and Eve, and they went to follow God. And God brought out a Messiah from that. But remember, Adam gave the planet to who? The serpent! So for us to forget that little part of stuff is really wrong because everything is there, but he's not. God bound him, rebuked him, stripped him. Some of the devils, some of the fallen angels, listen to me carefully, are even worse than Satan. Satan is smart enough to not do it too much to get bound up in chains yet. These creatures, there's 200 of them bound in chains in Sheol. Where do you get the figure 200? Book of Enoch. He lists them, names them. Book of Enoch is not a canonized, a fully inspired Bible, but we know who Enoch was. And did you know that Jesus quoted from the book of Enoch? So it's a help book, but it's not completely truth. Only scripture is true. But if it bolsters scripture, then we can accept it. And what it says is that 200 of them agreed and it came down on Mount Hermon and agreed to appropriate and to produce an offspring that's not godly. It's a satanic offspring. And it's still going on today. Still really is going on today. We'll get to that some other time when I do some specials, but I don't want to lose you. But so this is a whole entire group. So when Jesus came, what did he do? He stripped him. He bound up the ones that needed bound. And now all, he's, all Satan can do is he can, he can speak in his loud system and into your mind once in a while and tempt you once in a while, but he doesn't have the key to your back door. Only when we give it to him. Say amen. And we're covered in the blood, aren't we? So the death angel has to stay away from us? Amen. So these principles are not taught enough in the word so that people apply them. It's, oh, God, help me now. And God says, I already did. Would you bash the devil? You're going to let him break into your car? You're standing right there. Hit him in the head. <laughs> I don't do everything for you. I set you up so you just speak me, and I smash them. Speak me. I'll speak Jesus. You see? Speak me. Satan just cringes. Okay, let's go ahead. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent, remember, he's, he's really a serpent. He's not a little snake with a devil on him. Was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? God did not say that. He said, Stay away from this one. Remember now, I can't guarantee it, but Satan been playing on Eve for a little while. Come on, every man's tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and when he's played with it long enough and enticed with it long enough, it brings forth sin and sin when it's finished brings forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Amen. So she kind of fell hard, didn't she? Verse 2, and the woman, listen, this is very key. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the free of the trees of the, uh, we may eat freely of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of garden, God said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. God said, don't eat it, but she added, don't touch it. And I'm sure God meant, don't even touch it. Don't go near it. But what was she doing? Mm -hmm. Has God ever told you not to do something? You went and did it, and then you said, I'm sorry. We went right along. Verse 4. Waiting for my hiccups. Okay. Ever since, uh, you know, I lost my leg and everything like that, my, everything, my blood sugars and stuff are great and good, but I have a multi-hiccups. <laughs> Thank you for the information. Okay, so then the serpent said, verse 4, to the woman, 
You will not surely die, for God knows in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Envious. You, don't you want to be like God? Don't you want to know good and evil? Come on, Eve, little Evie, Evie. Come on, Evie, Evie. Evie. Gucci, 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 Gucci. Uh, and so she ate and gave it to her husband. Do you like those little funny things I do? I don't know why I do. You have to pray for me. Okay, so in verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree, she saw that the tree was good for food. God says, don't eat it. And then it was pleasant to the eyes. Pleasant to the eyes. And the tree desirable to make one wise. She took of the fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband, the ding-dong behind her, that was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them, don't get mad at me, please. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig trees together and made themselves coverings to hide from God. Why? They changed the godliness into the ungodliness. And now all they can see is evil and good, not God. All they can see is evil and good, not God. So who shows up to help? Do you think your God who loves you so much, who sent his son to die for us, that he would turn his back on Adam and Eve for just eating the tree? No. There was something in that poison tree that changed and killed their spirit and worked through their DNA. And if you'll check this out, I'm just going to encourage the bold and the brave, that you look at a, a development of an embryo, how it develops in a mother's womb until it's full age. I'll just recommend you watch it and see if you can't see the different stages of things. Satan worked as hard to get him to be inside our spirit. He couldn't do it. So now that you're born again, God is in here. Satan can't get in here. He can suggest things to you. He can set things up for you. If you're not listening, you're going to get yourself into debt. You're going to lose things. You better pay attention. This is not a game called life. This is life life. And so we need to be doing what God said. Are you in trouble? Listen to God and get out of it. Obey him. Be with him. This is a fallen planet. Don't camp here. Say amen. All right, so let's go on. So she saw it was good. You see the temptations there? Then the eyes of them were both open. All right, our next point is the three realms of temptation. And you've seen it right there. She saw that the fruit was good, pleasant to the eyes, to make one wise. Those are the three realms of where Satan tempts you. He uses your eyes, he uses your pride, and he uses your lusts, your desires of your flesh. So what do we do? We go to God in the morning and we crucify ourselves so that those things are shut off. You can't be uh, tempted in your eyes, can't be tempted. I had something happen to me the other day at Safeway. Now, you know my wife. Hi, wife. You know my, she's gone up with the ladies' retreat, right? Well, I was at Safeway shopping and I was picking up some jalapenos. Uh, to make for my, uh, my uh, street tacos for myself. I like to make things, you know, like that. And suddenly I felt a, a really weird presence. I don't know how to explain this to you. And I turned around and there was this beautiful lady. And she was real, looked like she was going to give birth at any minute. She was just tremendously pregnant. And God says, she is a hybrid. I said, what? Now, remember, I'm not thinking any of this stuff. Something crossed in her. She's not totally human. Now, you take it for what you want, but there was an... How do I say this? 
there was a, a scent. And it wasn't a pregnant scent. It wasn't an unbathing scent. It was a not of this earth scent that was coming off of her that was repugnant. And not, about, not, not from not, this lady was beautiful. She was clean, beautiful, dressed, so it wasn't anything of her body. It was something weird. And God says, take a good look. You're going to see more of these. I thought, oh, my gosh. So I will leave it at that. But that was the weirdest thing. Remember I told you about the witch I ran into up in Buckley one time. This was even weirder. But I looked at her, and I said, excuse me, and she moved on by, but she was... You get a chance to listen to some L.A. Mizzouli. He does studying in these areas that, that people won't touch. <laughs> I don't mind. But he says he's got a friend that he interviewed that actually ran into one, too. And the lady always wore glasses, and when she took them off, her eyes were huge. It just freaked him out. Him and his friend ran out of the apartment. So you say, do those things really happen? I don't know, hang out in Seattle for a while, I'll see what we have. <laughs> yes, they do. And they're happening more and more. It's no big deal. You'll say, well, how come it's not a big deal? Because you've been in the shadows for a long time, and now you're coming to the light. You're going to begin to hear and see things that you're going, so where was I all this time? You woke up. That's what happened. We're waking up. Amanda, we're waking up. We're coming alive and understanding the way things really are. Kind of weird, though. <laughs> so anytime you want to talk to me about my experiences and some of the things I ran into, please do. I mean, how often can you have time with, a, with the pastor and his wife, just talk all day and share, huh? So far, as we grow, we probably won't have that time to spend with you like we want to. So I want to take time now to pour stuff into you. Say amen. So don't write me off as being weird, because I thought it was weird. It was really weird. It's Safeway, my little Safeway over here. I mean, this lady had vibes coming off of her. Vibes had vibes. And the pugness. I mean, I was within 20 feet of her. And there was a, like the devil was saying, get away from me, get away from me. It was the weirdest thing. And she had this phony smile on her face. Like the lights are on and nobody's home. Beautiful girl. She would have, if she would have not been pregnant, and pregnant's beautiful too. But she would have been on the call or anything. You know what I mean? Just unusually different. My wife and I saw another one one time. We were coming down here, uh, 112. Stopped at the light where Tacoma Boys is. And we're headed, we're headed west and east west. And I saw this guy. How many's ever read the Mag Mad Magazine comic? Remember they had the two spies in there with the big noses and the hats? One was good, one was good, and one was evil. Hello? I saw a guy, my wife and I, I said, look at that. The guy's walking down the streets like this. And he wasn't a paraplegic or anything. He wasn't human. His legs were almost twice as long as normal. His body was going, he had this zoot suit on that he looked like he was the mask guy, you know? And he was walking down the road like this. And everybody was standing and looking, and he just looked odd. Am I imagining this? I better have my kids pray, pray for me. But we, I, Linda and I, we, we saw that, and I said, this is the strangest thing I ever saw. We're going to see more and more of these things. God said in the last days, weird things are going to happen. Who are we to have our eyes focused on? Eyes on Jesus off of the world system, off of others, say amen, people make mistakes, and off of ourselves, say amen, so we can continually be led of God through this maze of goodness called the earth. Right, Linda? Hallelujah. All right, so you with me. Three, uh, okay, go with me to 1 John chapter 2. Three realms of temptation. Pick up verse 15. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. Now we know why. Because the enemy's there. Remember, he doesn't have power to show up in your living room, but he can con you out of things, so stay focused on God. 
Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's not dwelling in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, she saw was good for food. The lust of the eyes, pleasance to the eyes. And the pride of life, it could make you wise. Is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away. Say amen. God's going to renew it for you. And the lusts thereof, but he who does the will of God, say that's me. So you're going to do the will of God no matter what you see, what you hear. You're going to do the will of God because God's going to help you to do the will of God. It is so exciting to do the will of God. Much more healthier. No, hardly any waste of time. I call it low mess, no stress. Hello. Listen to God. Slow down. Focus. Slow down. Focus. We've been hearing that a lot, haven't we? Okay, you with me? Notice these three areas, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We will see the same devil has no new tricks, just different labels, all fit under those three categories. And all temptation comes to the flesh. Satan can't tempt your spirit. God lives there. Hello? And if you will let God run your life, you won't be tempted hardly at all. Why? Because God is in charge. He won't have it. But we don't always let God be in charge. Somehow, we're learning though, somehow we just slip and take charge and that's when we get tempted. Every man's tempted when he's drawn into his own self. Drawn away in his own lusts. Okay, so, okay, so, again, so did you notice in Genesis 3 where Eve said that, oh, look, it's good for the eyes. It's, it's good for food. It's going to make me wise. You see the three realms, okay? Good for food, pleasant to the eyes, make one wise. You see, if we die to ourself, that temptation is no longer there. Hello? Hey, listen to this. This is a joke. I'm as wise as I'll ever be. Now, to your natural man, that's a, huh, no. Who's in us? So if you let him run your life, you'll be as wise as you can possibly be. So there's nothing wrong with that state. We just always analyze statements, the things we heard. No, you have God in you. Let him lead you. All right, are you still with me? Amen. So Luke chapter 4, please. Let's look at the temptation of Jesus, 1 through 13. I, probably for time, I'm not going to read it all. Remember the three temptations that Satan took to Jesus. Luke 4, starting at verse 1. Do you remember what they are? First thing Jesus did is he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, so he was probably hungry. So what does Satan do? He says, if you be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. He hit him in his hunger. Hunger comes from what? Your spirit or your flesh? flesh? There you go. And Jesus says, get the behind me, saying, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word proceeds out of the mouth of God. So it's not food that we feed on, it's the word of God. But we have food too. Say amen. Then he took him up into a pinnacle of the mountains and showed him all the kingdoms in a moment of a time. And he says, all these things I'll give you if you bow down and worship me. For they were delivered unto me. Who gave all the kingdoms and all the earth to Satan? Adam. Adam. Yeah. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. I don't know if I'm quoting it quite right. And then he takes him up to a pinnacle of pride, religious tower. Jewish pride is the temple. You know, let's make three tabernacles. <laughs> so he takes him up on the pinnacle of the temple and says, throw yourself down. You're the Savior. Angels will bear thee up. That's pride. So he got tempted, food, tempted, 
eyes, all these kingdoms, and the pride of life, throw yourself down. The angels will bear you up because you're very important, Jesus. You're very important. You see the temptation? Three areas. Satan doesn't have any new stuff. So if you're going to be in the flesh, you're going to be tempted. If you're going to get all huffy and buffy and doofy and a lot, you're going to get, have a rough time. So we want to avoid those things by meeting with God and have God lay out our day for us. Amen. All right, so thank God I saved us probably 10 minutes not reading that part. But it's 1 through 13. You get a chance to read it. See the three temptations. Now go with me to our last point. Yay! Temptation comes to our flesh realm and not to our spirit. Who lives in our spirit? Yeah, God does. Don't be afraid because when you're talking about the Lord in your heart, you're talking about Father, Son, Holy Spirit, okay? People get hung up on so much things. Don't be hung up. Just go with the flow. Amen. Not the people flow, but the God flow. Amen. Anyway, so the whole idea is that God wants us to stay out of the flesh. Now, when I was trained in Bible college, I was told, well, nobody could really stay out of the flesh. We're all in the flesh once in a while. No, we can stay out of the flesh. Even though we're in the flesh, we're not of the flesh. Can you say that? Even though I'm in the flesh, I'm not of the flesh. In other words, it's not your flesh dictating how you're going to feel one day. It's not your flesh that's going to make you feel happy or sad. Now, you might have impressions of happiness and ha sad, but you could rebuke those. Amen. Don't, don't sit around and go, why am I sad? Why am I sad? Why am I sad? And then the devil will come right up, and you'll start making a list. Well, it could be this. It could be this. You could be doing this. You could be doing this. Don't be opening the door for him to suggest stuff to you. Say amen. So let's look at what James says. James in chapter 1, verse 12 through 17. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Why? For when he has been approved, he will receive a crown of life to which God had promised to those that love him. God wants you to make it. Can you say amen? This whole world's a temptation. What is the temptation? To stay here and not go with God. Do you plan on staying on the earth? No. No, we're going to go, and God's going to redo the whole thing. And then come back and show us what his handiwork. Oh, my. And then open up the universe. Listen. Open up the universe for us to travel anywhere we want to go in a matter of thought. You want to be at, take a look of Jupiter and float around the rings for a little bit? Just in Jesus' name, boom, you're there. But we're talking about our supernatural being once we get off this planet. Jesus walked through walls. Remember the disciples? They were sitting there all, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Jesus walked right through the wall and says, hey, what are you doing? And he rebuked their unbelief. You're going to have a body where you can walk through walls. You can travel faster than the speed of light. Faster than the speed of light. Why? Speed of light's too slow. Because when you go from here to here in the speed of light, you've got all this space of time where you can be in your thoughts everywhere else. You travel at the speed of thought, not the speed of light. So while you're traveling a million miles in the speed of light, you could be a million places at the same time. That's how God is able, Michael, to be personal with you and with everybody in the world at the same time because he wants to be personal. You know what God's doing? And this is for you. He's going to teach you, Michael, how to understand the gospel, how to put those puzzles together. So it's just not a feel-good, I'm saved thing, but it's going to be walking with Jesus thing. Cool. Amen. Amen. I love God when he does that. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. All right. So let's finish up. I'm really kind of, really, it's foggy up here, and I'm kind of lightheaded. So we'll, let's go through this. But each one, listen, 
So, okay, I got I got to slow this up. But a man endures temptation that he has been approved of God. He shall receive a crown of life to those that have been promised. Now, verse 13 says, let no one say when he's tempted, God is putting me through the mud and the crud. That I'm being tempted by God. Doesn't it just say that? Who's James? He's our brother of Jesus. He was raised with Jesus. He thought Jesus was crazy until the last. Then he realized everything Jesus was doing was for us. And he says, look. He says, God doesn't tempt anyone. He doesn't put nasty trees in the garden for his kids to eat and die forever. It's time you and I get up with a flag and we start marching in these churches as get out of here and get this unbelief going. Man, the revival's here. Sitting around going, oh, we're waiting for the Lord to come. <laughs> My goodness. Thank you, Michael, for that amen. And it goes on. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. You have to get in the flesh for Satan even to get a hold of you. He'll suggest, hey, wouldn't that taste good right about now? I mean, have you ever... I, I don't like to taste the alcohol. I don't drink. I used to drink a lot, but I never liked to taste. I always drank to get buzzed. You know, is you want to give me a beer? It better be an 18 proofer. Because uh, I'm not drinking all that water beer. I won't use the other name. You see, when I drank beer, you drank that water beer, but light, but, but. Now, did you see that last commercial? People are diving and throwing buds away like I wouldn't believe. Some guy shot a whole cases of them with his shotgun and says, I'm no more bud. And it was because of a transvestite advertising Jewish bud commercials. And if we're supposed to think that's all right. Let me put one past you and you guys watching. I'm wondering if Satan doesn't have a way of corrupting a human being so bad they're no longer human anymore like a, a transvestite. Now, they could be saved, but who knows where the cutoff end is, where their blood is changed. Look at Sodom and Gomorrah, sweetheart. Their blood was changed. They were not human any longer. And God just had to destroy them. So you got any of these gay blades and all this other stuff going on in your family, you better have a sit down with them. And you better straighten out right now unless you want to be dead forever and in hell. And you have to find that boldness. Well, I'm afraid. If you do it in love, they're not going to, they're not going to hate grandma, brother or sister. They're not going to hate mom for telling the truth. And if they do, God forbid. And finishing. <laughs> Boy, I cover a lot of areas, don't I? Did I hit anything that you have? Yeah, I'm just joking. All right. All right. So, so the next words he says to us, look, do not be deceived. Three realms of deception. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift. What gift? Every perfect gift. What What gift? is from above and comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no changeableness, variation, nor shadow of turning. God's going to be good to you all the time, Sherry, whether you blow it or not. See, we need to get that in our mind because we're always, uh, when we make mistakes, because we all do, we always want to punish, kind of help God punish us. And you want to do that because God is not doing that. He corrects us. He chastises us. But the word is an old English word, which means he uses words to help train us to a different way of looking at things. Repentance means to have a change of mind and turn from the one way you were doing things to the other way now of God's way of doing things. Say amen, somebody. Now, did you get something out of this lesson today?